Support for this podcast comes from the FAU Master of Science in Finance program. The 16-month Master of Science in Finance trains current and future professionals for productive careers in financial management, investment banking, and investment management. The program includes Bloomberg certification and preparation courses for the CFA Chartered Financial Analyst designation. Learn more at business.fau.edu slash finance. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nightline. My name is Rainford Knight, and my guest today is Mr. Tom Essay, the founder of Sevens Research Report. Prior to founding Sevens Research Report, Tom began his career on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, working for Merrill Lynch's Institutional Equity Division, where he executed trades for some of the largest hedge funds and mutual funds in the world. After leaving the NYSE, Tom and a partner started a commodity-focused global macro hedge fund, where he was the head of research, uh, analysis, and trade execution. In 2007, Tom started a Sevens Report, which provides accurate, unbiased, succinct market analysis. The Sevens Report is used by thousands of financial professionals today. Tom is a regular on CNBC, Fox Business, Yahoo Finance. He's also widely quoted in the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, Bloomberg, to name a few. Tom holds an undergraduate degree from Vanderbilt and an MBA from the University of Florida. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for being on Nightline. Rainford, thank you very much for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Great. So, Tom, you know, one of the burning questions today is, where is the economy going? Are we looking at a deep recession or is the economy recovering? Uh, the term that's used these days is a K-shaped recovery. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so the, the K-shaped recovery is something that's sort of becoming popular in the lexicon. And essentially what they mean by that is that there's going to be two recoveries depending on on um, sort of what you do, where you are in the socioeconomic demographic, where people who can work from home, uh, who hire, have higher degrees, they, they see essentially a V-shaped recovery, which is the top half of the K. And then people who are in the service industry potentially have less uh, education and, and potentially more advanced, less advanced services they see essentially the bottom half of the K. And there is, some, there is some data to imply that's occurring. On the positive side of things, though, I, I, I prefer to talk about the economy and what's happened through the shutdown and through the pandemic as sort of as, as if we were on a walk and we come across to a, and we come up to a great valley, right, or a canyon. And we're looking down at the canyon, and then we can see across to the other side. And essentially what has occurred has the government, through stimulus, through the PPP loans, through the direct payments, through the, the, the weekly unemployment that, that expired about uh, six weeks ago, they are essentially trying to build a bridge right. across this canyon. Right. And the question is whether or not the bridge will be long enough. And if it's not, you fall off. You know, into, into the canyon. And I think that we are, we are about halfway across, and I think the jury is still out on, on whether or not that bridge gets it there. Positively, we probably missed the worst of what it could have been. Uh, I agree. Along the same lines of the bridge analogy, I mean, is the full impact of COVID being felt uh, throughout the economy, or is there a lag? Uh, it's definitely a lag, especially because of stimulus. You know, it's one of the things we talk about here all the time is that, you know, what, people are, of course, referencing what's occurred over the past year to the past two sort of bear markets or market turmoil periods, which is a global financial crisis and then the tech bubble bursting before that. But this one's very different than both for one for many reasons, but one big reason in the tech bubble burst essentially tech investors took the loss and that had a very long economic impact as people repaired their savings, repaired their personal balance sheet. In the housing bubble bursting, housing investors took the loss, right? And it took years for them to repair their, their personal balance sheet. This time, the government is sort of trying to take the loss. Right. right. And, and we don't know what that's going to do over the longer term, but we do know it will reduce the lag time, but there will be a lag time. I mean, the, the economy will be in slow-go mode for at least a year. Yeah, I, you know, I agree. I looked at the number of companies that are announcing layoffs going mm -hmm. forward, which had, and these layoffs have not, they haven't shown up yet in the, in the uh, unemployment numbers. Yep. And you're looking at, you know, thousands of, of, of uh, potential uh, un unemployed folks going forward from uh, places like, you know, MGM and American yep. Airlines and Delta yes. and Schlumberger. I mean, just 21,000, 18,000, 19,000. Yep. 
So yep. definitely, uh, I, I think uh, you're absolutely spot on. I think there there is a lag that that's uh, that's forthcoming. That the economy is in a lag, and and so so we haven't really felt the full impact of COVID. Uh, it, it's very interesting. Now along along those lines. We have this lag. What's going on with the technology uh, stock <laughs> segment of the market? Uh, is there a bubble? You know, I, I don't know if it's a bubble like the 2000s, but are people aggressively you know, funneling money into these tech names based on the assumption that sort of the way things are now is the way they will be in perpetuity? I think the answer is yes. And, and, and it's important to realize that the tech can be overvalued, but not in a 2000 type bubble. These are, these right. are a lot, these are very different companies than we're talking about in, in 2000. But at the same time, there's also a very compelling reason that people are stampeding into tech. And it's because most of these tech companies, people believe, have secular growth trends that are the best in the market. And what I mean by that is that they're going to grow earnings almost irregardless of what happens in the economy. Right. And right. when you look around the marketplace and you see bonds yield nothing, right, and you have some potential risk if you see even a, a small uptick in inflation, and you look at industrials and it's unclear on the global recovery, and you look at financials and you say, how are they going to make money with no yield, with, with you know, interest rates so low? There's sort of this TINA effect, TINA standing for there is no alternative right. to going right. into these tech names. Are they overvalued? Yes. Do they need to come in more to be at healthier valuations? Absolutely. But at the same time, there is a very compelling growth story to, to the, the good companies in tech. No, I, I agreed. I agreed. And I was reading a, an article that said most of the uh, rise in the Dow is attributable, attributed to, I think, three, three names, three or four names, yep. which is amazing when you think about how far the index has gone up. Absolutely. Well, you remember, uh, I mean, you, you'll remember from your, your, your financial history as I do, the nifty 50 of the right. 60s, right? Well, now it's the nifty five. Yeah. <laughs> you know, nice. I mean, it's, it's, there's so much concentration into these companies, you know, your, your Facebooks, your Apples, your Amazons, your Microsofts. It's, it's um, a typical market historian. And what I learned trading will tell you this is not healthy, nor is it sustainable. You want to see more um, disbursement of the rally. But at the same time, I, Rainford, I could have been telling you that a year ago. Right. You know, right. And it still keeps going. So it's, it's sort of proving the historians wrong. Now, now interestingly, along the bubble uh, uh, conversation, what about real estate? The market is mm. very hot uh, right now. And I've heard stories of people coming in with cash, gobbling up uh, residential real estate. What, what's your view on that? The commercial side, the, the play is a little different. But on the residential side, the market definitely, has definitely heated up. Yeah, very much so, especially here where we are, right, in Palm Beach County, where it's, I think, one of the hottest markets in the entire country. Um, again, you know, are, are prices probably overextended in the short term? Yes, but you also have a couple important factors that, that, that imply that the gains are sustainable over the longer term. The first is incredibly low mortgage rates, right? I mean, right. Correct. every time... I, I turn around, I think the mortgage rates can't get any lower, and indeed they do. So affordability is going to be up. Secondarily, you do have asset inflation coming from, you know, the, the enormous QE programs, the yes. stimulus. Yes. That's that's going to put a tailwind on real estate. And then especially here, in, and this is a big differential between 2005 and now that people need to get right. In 2005, the real estate prices were being inflated by speculators, people buying two, three, four homes and then trying to flip them and rotate out of them as fast as they could. So when the plug got pulled, it was the leverage that killed everybody. Right, right. These houses now are being bought by people who can afford them. Yes. And that's a huge differentiating factor, and it implies to the long-term sustainability um, of, of, of the real estate market, especially here locally, I think. And what, speaking of real estate, uh, the Fed has, and given low rates, has had a major impact on, on the market, given the low rates. What do you think about this policy change to uh, what is now called the flexible average inflation rate? Mm -hmm. um, what, what does that mean for the economy and for Main Street in general? Sure. So uh, it, it means higher inflation in the future. But the, 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 there's a couple things about this. First of all, for everybody, to, you know, the Fed has a wonderful way of, of speaking in very complicated terms about something that's actually very simple. Sure. Right? So what, what they're doing, so for the, in the 70s and 80s, inflation was a problem. It was such a problem, it was causing recession. So they essentially changed tactics and they said, every time inflation gets close to 2%, we're going to whack it down like whack-a-mole. 
Right. right. Now they're essentially changing and they're saying we become so effective at this that we, we can't actually get inflation to move up anymore. So we're going to change our strategy and we're going to let it run above 2% to pull the average inflation up to 2%. What that means is, is for in the short term, nothing. Right. This is this is unimportant for the vast majority of people in the short term and probably in the medium term defined by, you know, say 12 to 18 months. But in the longer term, it, it, it implies that inflation will run hotter than we have seen it in decades. And it's important from an inflation standpoint for people to realize that there are inflation statistics that are quoted and then there is real life inflation. Exactly. And for most people, real life inflation is quite high. And it's going yes. to get higher. Yes. Right. That's that's sort of the biggest takeaway. So as you look at 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 sort of how are you positioned in your personal finances and your retirement plans, you want to be exposed to higher inflation so that, that you can get that benefit. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. What does this mean though from a from a broader economic perspective? Allowing inflation to run high, uh, that's bad for the dollar. Am, am I mm-hmm. correct in that assertion? You're 100 percent correct. Now, this is, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this, but there's right. there's a lot of people who think that the reason the Fed can't generate inflation the way it 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 wants to is because it 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 it's looking at inflation the wrong way. So mm-hmm. if we think about if we think about the effects of globalization, right, of essentially outsourcing all of our manufacturing to the third world, that has had and and then couple with that the the parabolic advancements in technology over the past 30 years. Th- those two forces have combined to have a massive deflationary impact on all the goods we buy. I mean, think about TVs, right? At Rainford, I could go down and get a $300 smart TV at Walmart today that is 10 times better than a $3,000 TV 15 years ago. Yeah, true. Right? Absolutely. And and so when you get the statistics of that, it has tremendously negative deflationary influences on inflation statistics. I personally believe they need to change the way they look at inflation because it's a, it's a different world now. And and look at asset inflation. What is the what are stocks doing? What are real, what is real estate doing? Can people afford to buy homes? Right. Unless they're making tons of money. You right. know, that's what real inflation is to people. So I think that it's it's it is dollar negative this this policy change and that will only add to the inflation. So, so the big thing over the next coming years is higher inflation. And, and a lot of people who, who are under the age of 60, uh, frankly, don't, you know, have no experience with inflation. So this is a vulnerability sure. for investors. That's true. And retirees now, well, higher long term, it may be helpful. But currently, under the current scenario, uh, there is no way they're generating yield is going to be a challenge going forward. So retirement uh, income returns are, are definitely going to take a hit. Very much so. And inflation is sort of the, the a, a retiree's worst nightmare. Correct. Right? Because they are they're living on a fixed income for the most part. Uh, they're, they're, most of them are older, too old to work or, or don't want to work anymore. And inflation is, is a killer. So to a point, is the Fed playing with fire? I, I think that they are. Um, of course, happily, I'm sure all those people are much more intelligent than I am. So I'm sure they'll figure it out and do a good job. <laughs> but, uh, but, but they are, you know, this... This is sort of this reminds me of of what happened with the financial crisis, um, especially when uh, Congress got involved and started undoing laws that were put in after the depression to help prevent bubbles in real estate. And they undid them for for the belief that we had become much more sophisticated and smart and we could not get ourselves into this problem, which, of course, we got ourselves right back into the problem. Um, I, I fear we have we have slain the dragon of inflation and, and, and over the next five years, we may wake him back up. No, I, absolutely. So, so given all of this, the economy, the markets, what would be your survival guide going forward? Yeah, I, 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 in the very short term, is the market overextended? Yes, it is. Um, is is you know it, between now and year end, should everybody expect more volatility in the stock market? Absolutely. I mean, we're going through the biggest pandemic in a hundred years. The stock market is miraculously up year to date, which you know is sort of if we just step back and think about that, is somewhat of an absurdity considering what's happened to uh, employment and earnings. But over the longer term, really, I think the takeaway for this is that this is this is the important part of diversification and having a long-term financial plan, and and staying invested. 
because if there's a vulnerability, as I said, over the next five years, the vulnerability is that is that people are too conservative and they lose out to inflation. Um, and it's it, to me, the survival guide is is staying in equities with the understanding that there will be volatility. Right. Focus right. on good companies, right? Large companies, good companies with strong cash flows. Uh, from a yield standpoint, that's a tricky one. Uh, if you buy a U.S. Treasury, you're effectively losing money. Correct. Because inflation rate's much higher than where the yield is. So I think you, you have to go into the, uh, the some preferred stock is interesting, some some junk bonds are interesting, but you've really got to do your research. But for, for, the, for the, the vast majority of us, the trick is stick to the plan, stay invested, keep your asset allocations uh, you know, appropriate and diversified, and just you know, work the plan because there will be volatility. There will be scares. And we're not getting out of this thing unscathed. There's no question yeah, right. about it. But, but over the longer term, the trick is don't get out. Stay invested because it's an inflation issue. And also, you know, if you're thinking about taking advantage of another part of the survival guide, take advantage of historically low interest rates. You know, if, if if you have been thinking about buying a house, if you have been thinking about taking a home equity line of credit to improve the value of your house, your house is a very uh, positively correlated to inflation, right? Plus, you get a living dividend, what I call a living dividend, where you it's nice to live in a nice house. Correct. Right? So, <laughs> so take advantage of that money, uh, of this free money, of this cheap money, and use it uh, to, to provide yourself long-term gain. And finally, I always say this, if you have high credit card rates, figure out a way to get that rate low. If you have, if you have a, a home and you have a home equity line of credit, yet you have a very large credit card balance, there's nothing wrong with borrowing cheap money against your house to pay off the credit card and then repaying yourself through the house because you're saving yourself a lot of money on interest rates. Get rid of those credit card balances, borrow all the money you need now while rates are low. Great, great. Thank you, everyone, for listening to Nightline. And thanks again to my guest, Mr. Tom S.A. of Seven's Report. Nightline is part of the FAU Business Podcast Network. Learn more at business.fau.edu slash podcast.